Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Charles Maselli. He was a member of the Chicago Outfit, which is the Mafia in Chicago. He was also around a lot of major mob guys back in his era. Charles also was a cop, and he went to prison ultimately for over 20 plus years. And he's seen a lot, and he's been through a lot, and got a lot of stories. Charles is also in the process of working on reopening the Family Secrets case. Now Charles claims he has a lot of proof that will set the record straight and say that they missed a lot of stuff while they were doing this case. I'm here just to report the story. You decide whether you want to believe it or not. But without further ado, let's get into it. Hey, Adrian, how are you? I'm glad to be here with you today. Good, me too, man. Um, you know, for the people, you know, let's that don't know you, let's kind of get into your, you know, your early life. What was it like? Well, I grew up in a town that was predominantly a mob stronghold called Elmwood Park, Illinois. Uh, I grew up on the northwest side of the city of Chicago. And basically, you know, to your viewers and people that are out there, um, it's like, you know, oh, wow, the mob, the mafia, the outfit, uh, whatever name you want to call it, depending on what area you're from. To me, it was just people that I knew and grew up with my whole life and associated with. Um, you learn a lot of things over the years that people... And the way things were in the old days, the people today and the generations that have become like their children and grandchildren, I've, I've learned something, especially recently, um, that a lot of the old ways and the old values are completely gone. The integrity, the, uh, the tight-knittedness amongst everybody, um, that has been pretty much forsaken by people today. And I try to still live my life by the old code. I'm not perfect at it by no means. Uh, I don't think anybody is. But uh, it's I, I started at a very young age being around some of the most influential people in the outfit that there were. What was your first interaction that you had with a outfit member? Uh, my first interaction, as I've interviewed and told many people before, was when I met Joe Lombardo when I was about five years old. Um, my mother and father went through a pretty rough divorce and my mother attempted suicide and Joe basically rescued her and saved her life. Um, got her to a hospital, uh, took care of her, made sure that the cause of the problem, which at the time was my father, um, never bothered her again. And I never knew Joe as, you know, Joey the Clown Lombardo or, you know, Joe the Gangster. I knew him as, you know, Uncle Joe or, you know, Mr. Joe or, you know, Mr. Lombardo. And then as I grew older, we be, we had a stronger bond, albeit, you know, it wasn't one of these things where, you know, a lot of these guys, that, and I want to clarify this right off Jump Street, a lot of these, what the life was really like in Chicago. You know, New York, not downing New York at all, but they have a whole different mindset out there where, you know, guys run around with track suits and they're all four, five, six of them walking down a block, putting on a, an escapade. That's not tolerated in Chicago. It never was. They weren't, they, they weren't a glorified um, Gotti-esque, I guess is a good word. You know, we got to put on a show. Chicago was all about being low-key, staying under the radar, handling your business, and, you know, to a certain degree, the old timers like Tony Accardo and, you know, Sam Giancana and Joe Lombardo were about helping people, you know, helping a lot of the Italian people in their neighborhoods, um, doing a lot of righteous things as much as, you know, ain't none of them were saints. Nobody will ever say that, and it's not true. But, I think a lot of people mis mistook what they were and who they were, and they were fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers and uncles and aunts and uh, guys that went to work at city jobs every day. And yeah, they were they were tied into the organization just like I was when I was an officer, and when I worked in various you know governmental positions that I got. Well, in Chicago, you had to have clout, political pull. And a lot of that political pull was owned by the outfit. So it kind of went hand in hand. You yeah. know, if you, wanted a, if you wanted a public servant job, 
you had to have either a lot of political connections or you had to have outfit connections. Sometimes you had to have both. Yeah. And what was your, uh, you know, your first step into the outfit? My first step into the outfit came in the 80s um, when I started bodyguarding some people that were up and comers, associates. And basically they would send me out to do run errands, you know, just like typical everybody else climbing the ladder, you know, in any organization, you get, you get trusted with small things and then you do the small things, right. They give you something bigger. You do that, right. They give you something bigger. You do that, right. You give you something bigger. And depending on who you come from as a family member, you know, it depends on how fast you escalate up that ladder. And, you know, it's just like anything else. It's, you know, how big are your balls? You know, now, what, what were uh, some of the, you know, smaller things and then the, you know, bigger things that they eventually had you do? Well, I did everything from, you know, uh, collect juice loans. I, uh, at different times in my life, I was more on the polished end of it. You know, I did a lot of political stuff where I was involved with keeping one in particular politician out of trouble. Um I ran nightclubs for the organization. Um, I looked over the shoulder of people that were brought in to make sure they could be trusted and made sure that certain operations were protected at times, um, that certain rules weren't broken, um, and to make sure that we always made money. You know, that was the biggest thing about it, making money. You know, make money for the bosses, make money for yourself, make money for the organization. And if you're an earner, you were far more valuable than a killer. But then there was times that you had to get your hands dirty, you know, and either you were either you were there with that or you weren't. Was there a certain situation that you can speak on that you had to get your hands dirty? I got my hands dirty a lot. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I've got something. I've got to be kind of careful, Adrian, because a petition sitting in U.S. District Court right now that is about to be given a hearing in a couple of weeks um, where I will be testifying in the infamous family secrets case, hopefully, and unraveling a lot of misnomers and lies and corruption, both from the angle of some of the defense, some of the, not all, some of the defense attorneys in the family secrets case and the prosecutor and even up to and inclusive of the judge that handled that case that may there's only one last well there's two last people that were part of the family secrets case that are still incarcerated and it may result in their convictions being overturned and them given new trials Damn. So what originally brought this whole family secrets trial? And for the people that don't know, what is it? Oh, God. How honest do you want me to be? Well, I mean, just and I guess from the I don't know. I mean, from your perspective, I suppose. Um, what brought me into the family secrets case is in 2001, I was cooperating with the ATF in an investigation that was totally at least we thought was totally unrelated. Um, they approached me concerning resolving some of my own crimes, mm -hmm. um, resolving an issue I had with someone that betrayed me. And I will make it very plain. Nobody condones a rat or a snitch or an informant. Um, it's the worst thing you can be. But there's a real fine line there that people don't understand. And I'm going to say this, and it's the first time I've ever said it publicly. But I say it to a lot of people in private, and I think it's about time I said it publicly. I'm a cobra, I'm a rattlesnake, and I'm an asp. If you leave me alone and you don't come after me, I'm going to mind my own business and I'm not going to be no trouble to you. you know. But if you come after me, I'm coming with everything I got. And my bite is pretty serious. And there was um, there were some serious crimes that were going on with this case. And, you know, what what were some of them that were going on that, you know? Well, the guys were originally indicted because it was a, a guy with a daddy complex, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I'm probably and I admit it, I'm the king of a daddy complex. I had a father that wasn't the greatest father in the world to me. He was horrible to my mother. Um, but this guy, Frank Calabrese, Jr., 
who's pretty well known and you know public uh, personality, I guess you say now, stole from his family, stole from his father, didn't want to deal with the ramifications of stealing from his own blood, didn't want to deal with the ramifications of being a drug addict, and chose to turn his own father in. And when the government didn't even really believe the stories he was telling them, as it's well known, he wore a wire in Milan Federal Prison on his own father. And then when they still didn't believe him, he was able to induct his uncle, Nick Calabrese. And between them and, in my personal opinion, a corrupt U.S. attorney that was on a career building um, kick, they concocted the Family Secrets case. When I was working with the agents that I worked with in 2001, our paths crossed a little bit. I gave them some information about somebody that was a missing person that I happened to know where the location of the remains were. At the same time that Frank Jr. was providing them the same information about this person, saying that the remains were somewhere else. Well, because Frank Jr. was giving up names like Joe Lombardo and John DeFranzo and Frank Schweiz and Jim Marcello and all these, you know, big guy names. And I was telling the truth that it really wasn't big guys that were involved in this. It was little guys, I guess the best way you could put it. Um, the government and this prosecutor, who's now deceased, uh, he passed away right after the trial, um, chose to go with the more sexy, you know, hey, I'm going to start them case uh, version of it. And they shut our investigation down, branded me a con man, branded me a liar, said I was full of shit. And for five years, I wore that. I wore it. And then in 2005, when the Family Secrets indictment finally came down, I found out that Joe was indicted for the murder of a mutual acquaintance of ours, uh, Joe Seifert's dad, Danny Seifert, and that Joe was accused of planning and executing Joe's murder. Um, I am not convinced, personally, that Joe, if he was there that day, was there for any other reason but to protect Joey's mom from being killed because the guys that were sent out to do this job were the most cold-blooded, calculating murderers that the outfit had at that time. Uh, Anthony Spilatro, Frank the German Schweiz, John Fecarata, Richard Medea, and Tom Schreiber. And Tom Schreiber was my uncle. He was a low-level associate um, who later became Richard Medea, a dirty Chicago cop's son-in-law. And the stories, depending on who tells it and what you want to believe... You know, Joey Lombardo was there that day. Um, I'm not going to ever dispute Mrs. Seifert and her account. But what I will say, and I, I think this is the first time I've also said this publicly. She admitted under oath that everybody was wearing ski masks. And the only reason she was able to identify Joe Lombardo was supposedly by his gait and the sound of his voice. Um, that's pretty flimsy to send somebody away for prison for life without parole. Um, I, as an eight-year-old boy, was being babysat by my Uncle Tom, and it was kind of, that's how stupid my own uncle was. He threw me in the car at eight years old and said, here's a blanket, here's some soda pop, and here's some candy. We stopped and picked up. Stay in the car, stay under the blanket. I got to go handle something. And I was at the scene the day that Joe Seifert's father was executed. I witnessed it. In all of these years, since 1974, I've never been polygraphed. I've never been properly debriefed, um, except by the ATF. I've never been given an opportunity to testify in open court, which is hopefully something that's going to happen now. Not that it'll do Joe Lombardo any good because he's passed on to, you know, another world. Um, and there's a lot of hair splitting here. I mean, and, I, and I'm going to also kind of break some news. Uh, Joe Seifert and I, for a very short period of time, became very close. And now we've distanced from each other. And to be honest with you, I don't even know why. 
I have nothing but respect for Joey Seifert. I think Joey Seifert and his family went through hell. I think the government lied to them. Um, Joey and I talked about doing a um, project together that was going to expose the other side of Joe Lombardo because for all the animosity and hatred that Joe and Nick um, in their documentary said that they had for Joe Lombardo, I've had conversations and interviews with Joey on his podcast um, where we talked about how they felt that Joe was Uncle Joe to them, just like he was like family to me. Um, so you were in there uh, when you I'm were sorry? a kid, when you were a kid, and you know, uh, eight years old. You know what was uh, kind of going through your head? Did you hear gunshots or did you hear anything? Like what? I watched Rick Medea pull the trigger on the shotgun that killed Nanny Seifert. Um, I know what happened to some of the weapons afterwards. And the problem is, and, and I get this, Adrian, I get it. It's really hard for people to swallow that an eight-year-old kid will be brought to an outfit hit. But the problem is, is they don't know how dumb my uncle was. And I love my uncle to death. He was my idol uh, later in life. I became a deputy sheriff because of him. Um, he wasn't the sharpest tool in the drawer. And the bottom line here is justice. I don't know what you know about the scales of justice. The scales of justice is it's in a lot of courtrooms and stuff. And it's a woman that is holding basically a scale. Oh, okay. she's got a blind, And she's got a blindfold on. Well, the reason for that blindfold and a little bit of a history lesson here is that justice is supposed to be blind. The truth is the truth. And when you put a case before a jury, the defendant is supposed to have his say. The prosecution has their say. The judge kind of makes sure that everybody follows the guidelines of the law and doesn't really decide what the jury hears so much as he decides that they hear it in such a way that it's legal. Well, what Judge Zagel chose to do in the Family Secrets case when I came forward in 2005 and told him, hey, you got it wrong about several of these homicides in this case, and I can lead you to evidence that'll prove it. Well, he took that blindfold off himself, tipped the scale to the, to the prosecution side, and sent a bunch of men to prison for the rest of their life wrongfully. I don't know. Adrian, I wish I, I wish I had the answer. If you go on PACER, which is the federal court website, I am the only person in, I think, history of a federal criminal major indictment that's been allowed to become a movement in the case that was not a party to the case, that wasn't a defendant, that wasn't a prosecutor, that wasn't an attorney. I fought for 17 years to testify. And in those 17 years, do you think if I was lying that the government wouldn't have pulled me in and charged me with perjury or obstruction or something? They didn't do it because they knew one simple thing. When you're charged with a criminal offense, you're entitled to what's called discovery. And that discovery, my first thing would have been, well, you want Michael Alberto's body, this is where he's at. Well, when your witness, Nick Calabrese, said that him and his brother executed this guy um, and they went to 35th and Shields here in Chicago to locate him, they found nothing but dog bones. So how do you consider it equal and fair that if you got a witness saying, I can deliver a body to you, I just need the proper tools and investigative um, fairness that you gave this other guy, but you tore up this whole area at 35th and Shields and found nothing, but yet you still let this guy go to trial and testify and send these people away based on a bunch of lies. And the now, crux uh, of this was... I was going to say, now, didn't, didn't, didn't they at one point actually dig up an area that you wanted them to, or they attempted to? We went in in 2001. This was before Family Secrets. We okay. went into this area, and when I told the agents... You know, we, we walked through it, uh, some canines were brought in, an archaeologist was brought in, and the agent that I was working with, who in my opinion is probably one of the straightest federal agents I've ever met in my life, phenomenal investigator, um, he said, Chuck, we need a name 
before they're going to allow us to go any further with a dig or excavation site or anything. And I said, listen, I was a young kid when I saw this guy. I said he disappeared for a long time. And then in 1986, I know his body was dumped here and it was buried here. And I know who it was buried by. The only thing I know is they called the guy Bones and he was a loan shark from Chicago, from the north side of Chicago. When that was called in to the prosecutor, Mitchell Mars, who was the same prosecutor that prosecuted the guy that was involved in the Seaford case in the 80s, the same prosecutor that wrote my proffer agreement, and the same prosecutor that prosecuted everybody in the family secrets case and obstructed justice, in my opinion, um, they, shut the, they shut the excavation site down. They never brought in ground penetrating radar. They never did any of the things that have recently been done 50 years later with Jimmy Hoffa. I, I'm sure you heard about the Dabalico up in New Jersey where they were, oh yeah, there's a, a barrel 12 feet down. They spent two days out there. The FBI found absolutely nothing. You know, and I believe Scott Bernstein from the Gangster Report um, in the uh, original Gangster Podcast will corroborate me. Um, Scott is probably one of the biggest authorities on Hoffa in Detroit that there is out there and the most credible. And, uh, you know, they, they basically just, they'll run down a road if they think they can make, you know, some sexy news. But if it comes down to the truth, you know, and I'm, I'm not disparaging you, Adrian, but if I said, well, Chuck Maselli and Adrian did this, we're nobodies. But if I said tomorrow, uh, Joe Lombardo and Tony Accardo did that, well, everybody's all ears. And that's oh, not right. a fairness. And so, there, there was no fairness. So what ultimately, uh, you know, was this case that sent you away for 20 years? Was it this case? No, no it had so, nothing to do else? with this case. Oh, okay. I was involved in a I was involved in a business that failed in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, I was linked to organized crime. I was basically given the opportunity to take it, you know. And like I said, I'm not always the sharpest tool in the drawer myself. I was offered time served to plead guilty to something I didn't do. I took it to trial. When I went to trial, the when I got on the stand to testify, the judge told the process, we had a motion of in limine filed, which basically means you cannot talk about certain things. The motion in limine in my trial was that they couldn't mention organized crime because there was no organized criminal enterprise or organized criminal intent involved in my case. It was just a business gone bad and people trying to get out of it and duck for cover and wanted somebody to blame and tag I was it. Um, the prosecutor asked me who my investors were. And I kind of like choked up on the stand because I knew if I mentioned who was one of my investors, I was done. They were going to link me to organized crime and there was nothing I could do about it. And my, you know, court appointed attorneys sat there like an absolute imbecile. And it was the longest two minutes of my life until he jumped up and said, oh, your honor, I think I know why my client's not answering could we come talk to the judge? And they went up for a sidebar at the bench and I heard the whole conversation. My lawyer said, listen, if he mentions all the names of people that invested money with him or that he was associated with in this business, it's going to look like he's involved in organized crime because one of these names is very, very well known in organized crime circles. Um, the state has asked Mr. Maselli to lie about this person and he's refused to do so. And... Um, the judge turned around and said, I'll allow one question along these lines, make it good. And the prosecutor did. He said, I want the name of every single person that gave you any money whatsoever to open your business. And when I mentioned a certain name that I don't want to repeat now, um, the jury was out 32 minutes and they found me guilty. And the prosecutor had told me before I went to trial that if I didn't cooperate with him and basically roll over on somebody that had nothing to do with my business, uh, that he'd give me a 30 year sentence. And I'll be honest, the man was good for his word. They gave me 20 years. Damn, man. So right, right away, you just went and served 20 years. And then what about the other additional 10? Well, here's what happened. I did the first 10. I came home for about eight months and I was 
getting my life put back together. I wasn't allowed to leave Florida. I wanted to come home to Chicago. They wouldn't let me. And my probation officer knocked on my door. I was living with a girlfriend at the time who was very well to do. And we were living in a very nice home on the water. And this guy knocked on my door. He said, you're living like this and I live in a hovel. He said, you're doing something wrong. I'm going to find a reason to violate you. And I had started my construction company back up and Florida is very, very particular and harsh on contractors. If you don't have everything perfectly and you don't have every correct license, no matter how many licenses I had, I didn't have what they call the GC license, the general contractor's license. And I put a room addition up or I was in the process of doing it. And believe it or not, what sent me back to prison wasn't committing another crime. It wasn't committing a fraud. It wasn't committing a theft. It was a fucking building inspector code violation because I didn't have a general contractor's license and I built the sunroom. Jeez. That was enough. That was enough to get me reindicted for, you know, they, they charged me with so many counts, Adrian, it was unreal. How I many pled years? Guilty. I pled guilty to not having the license in Pensacola and, you know, not being able to finish the job. And I was wrong. I shouldn't have taken that type of a job without the right license. And by taking time served on that and sitting two and a half years in the county jail in solitary confinement, uh, when I went to the county that I was originally sentenced in, they lifted the suspended portion of the sentence and sent me back to prison for another 10 years. So that's how I ended up doing the 20. So what, were you on probation? Why would they give you 10? Well, they, the original sentence that I got from the first case, which was a one count scheme to defraud case was a 20 year sentence split. It's called a split sentence in Florida. I did 10 out, 10 suspended and 10 on probation. When I did my first 10, I went home with a split sentence, with a 10 year sentence hanging over my head and 10 years probation. And the corrupt probation officer I had that didn't like me because I wasn't living in a halfway house and I wasn't uh, flipping burgers at McDonald's um, and I was trying to run a business and make a life for myself again. And because my family wasn't poor and I wasn't poor and my girlfriend wasn't poor um, and he didn't like that, he used every tool he could to send me back to prison. And he did. And yeah. in Florida... You know, I don't know what you know about Florida, but they they used to have tourism as their number one uh, uh, basic income for the state. Now they have at least two to three prisons in every county. And the adage that people say is go on vacation, leave on probation, go back on violation is a very, very true thing. Jeez, That's man. how they make their money down there. Now, Chuck, when you were in there for 20 years... Uh... What did that look like for you, man? What was, it was horrible? What was it like? Like, because that's a long time, man. It was rough um, because I was an ex-cop and because I was a state and federal witness. Um, they put me in protective custody. I fought like hell and finally got out of there. And I walked the open compound most of my time because I don't do well around pedophiles. Um, I despise them. A rapist, a pedophile, I have nothing for. I think they're the lowest of the low. And personally, in my opinion, I think every one of them, if it's not some drama queen, you know, accusing baby daddy of something he didn't do. But if there's clear cut DNA evidence that, you know, this person hurt a woman or hurt a child, as far as I'm concerned, summary execution, take them out, put a bullet in their head, because that's the only way to cure them. And I fought my ass off to get out of protective custody and I went to the open compound but because a lot of people misconstrued all the stuff that's out there on Google about me and different things it, it got to be where it was dangerous and Florida was worried about my safety and after doing all the years that I did in the system in 2014 finally one of Joe Lombardo's attorneys David Bernstein uh, came to me and he said all these filings, Mr. Maselli, that I see in the Family Secrets case, what the hell is all this? And he was the first attorney in the case to ever question me. So I gave him an affidavit. I spoke with him. I interviewed uh, repeatedly with Mr. Bernstein. Um, I was investigated. I cooperated with him. He filed a motion in the court 
to have me brought forward on a um, uh, uh, resentencing motion and, you know, motion for new trial. Again, the judge ignored it illegally, um, dismissed it out of hand. With, when they were doing the interviews with me, I had a corrupt prison guard in Florida walk up to my cell and say, oh boy, we, we found out you're the big boy. You're going to testify for Joe Lombardo in, uh, in that family secrets case. Well, I can pay off my trailer by letting them boys get close to you. You'll be a dead man before you know it. And as a result of that, I was moved to another state almost immediately for my protection. And I completed my sentence out in the state of Alabama. What ended up uh, happening to that guard? Did they find out he was saying that stuff to you? Oh, yeah, they, they found out. It was all on camera. And, of course, you know, it wasn't audio recorded or anything. But you have to understand the Florida prison system is so corrupt and the guards are so corrupt, especially at certain prisons. It doesn't matter. I mean, there's a letter that's in the file. I think I sent you a copy of that David Bernstein wrote. They threatened to destroy my files and records uh, that supported, you know, my story. They're very anti-inmate, anti-civil rights. It doesn't matter whether you're Hispanic, black, white, green, purple, blue. Um, if the guards don't like you down there, they will make your life a living hell. Jeez, man. So they will be, I've watched guards beat inmates to death. I've watched guards put one inmate in another cell to intentionally murder an inmate during my years there. I've watched them allow suicides to take place while I did my time in Florida. Florida is the most corrupt prison system I've ever seen in my life. How many years were you there? 22 total. In the Florida one? Wow. Yep. And you luckily made it out alive after all that, everything that you went through, you know, and I'm when still in one piece, I ain't got no scars. I ain't been cut. I ain't been stabbed. I ain't been beaten. My manhood's still intact. So I guess I, I, you know, I must be a survivor, a pretty tough guy. Yeah. No kidding, man. What did uh, it look like when you came out? Scary as hell. Were you afraid for I your mean, life? When I left the when I left the when I left Alabama, um, they're about the second most corrupt prison system I've ever seen, uh, especially if you're Caucasian. Um, they don't like you down there. And when me coming from Florida and being a protected witness at that point as a defense witness, they really didn't like me. And uh, I spent most of my time in segregation. In fact, I spent my last two years of my sentence in solitary confinement. And when I left there, they sent me out of there with no money, a bus ticket. I missed my train. Uh, the bus dropped me off on the total other side of Alabama from where the train was at. I had to walk to get to the train station, missed my first train. And if it wasn't for a good Samaritan who let me have a phone call to my family where they could wire me some money and get me a hotel room, uh, I probably would have been dead that night. And I came home to Chicago and after being gone so many years and not seeing my mom or anything like that, I was culture shocked. Everything I knew had changed. Grocery stores, neighborhoods, uh, the way of life, the way things are going on nowadays like we see in the media every day. Um, you know, no offense to the younger kids, but these gangbangers and thugs taking over these, um, uh, you know, all of this animosity between people. It's ridiculous, Adrian. It is. It, it's absolutely asinine. In the old days, if the old gangsters, you know, the old mafia dons would have been in charge, none of this would have been allowed in Chicago. You wouldn't have had something happen like happened. You, you know, you, you could have had anything happen on any day, but the predominance of it, like it is today, was not allowed. So they, they kept really, control on it. So yeah, they kept they control. Kept, yeah, yeah. Okay. They kept and, control on it. And, you know, uh, like this Highland Park shooter, um, you know, you can't stop a crazy person. You know, you can't stop an animal from being an animal. But shooting at the Chicago police on a daily basis? No, wasn't happening. You know, threatening uh, court personnel or a reporter or anything that brought major heat wasn't going to be allowed. You'd end up in a trunk somewhere. 
And, yeah. you know, there was rules. You know, the guys, we did our thing. The police did their thing. You know, when, when we encountered them, even though they didn't like us, we didn't like them. But it was always, for the most part, unless, you know, some guys had altercations. I'm not going to say they didn't. But it was always, um, I guess, kind of an equal respect, you know. Yeah. And you're so, doing your thing. I'm doing my thing. And okay, you caught me. You got to do your job. Okay, officer, let's go. Now it's 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 insane. I, I mean, I wouldn't want to be a cop today. And I have much respect for law enforcement, even though I've been on the opposite end on both sides of the coin. I have total respect for these young men and women that are out there doing the job today because the circumstances they're doing it under today are next to impossible. I don't know how right. they do their job every day. You know, now that you've, you know, kind of stepped out of that whole life and stuff, what is, uh, you know, now that you're out of prison and everything like that, you know, you would you say that you've changed your life for the better now? I changed my life a long time ago, but I've got this stigma from what's out there on social media that I'm a con man, I'm a thief, I'm a liar. That is one of the reasons we filed the motions we filed recently, and we're going in with one last shot. Now that Judge uh, Zagel is no longer on the bench, we've got a new judge that seems very fair and very equal and very um, willing to listen. And he just granted the first time ever, we've been granted a hearing date on uh, August 10th to be heard before the federal court. And for the people that don't know, you know, what is this case that you're, you know, trying to reopen? Family secrets. Okay. And, you know, what is, uh, you know, your ultimate goal with reopening this? Expose the truth. Expose the fact that they suppressed my testimony throughout the trial that would have impeached the Cali both of the Calabreses and to show that the prosecutor that prosecuted the case was corrupt. Okay. And, uh. You know, will this, does this cause any fear on your life? You know, do they think anybody's going to give you any retaliation or be pretty pissed off? I'm already getting retaliation, I'll be honest with you. Um, I did an interview with some people today earlier before yours, and I was asked the same question. I'm more fearful of what the corrupt defense attorneys are going to do to me than I am what Nobody in the outfit's mad at me. Nobody in the federal justice system, I think, is going to go out of their way to harm me. I think the defense attorneys that dropped the ball and didn't do their job all these years, and I'm not going to name names, but there are certain specific ones that have associations with the cartel, that have associations with street gang members, are going to do everything in their power not to be embarrassed why they didn't do their job. That worries me greatly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a big deal. I mean, it's nothing to, to take lightly. And, uh, you know, I guess, you know, you said you, when, when is this happening? August 10th. Okay. So what, what are you doing to prepare for this? Um, I'm engaging with a couple of people that may represent me as an attorney. Um, and I'm doing everything I can to get as much of the evidence that I have that proves I'm telling the truth. Um, I have done this on a grander scale with some of the larger media in Chicago, not to get attention, not to get glorified, not to get my name in the paper, but to ensure that the evidence that I have that proves that I am telling the truth and that certain people did lie um, has been spread out enough that they're not going to be able to cover this one up. So once this all goes into motion, what does it look like after August 10th? What's the... Well, and I don't have a crystal ball, but, you know, I think what's going to happen in my personal opinion is they're probably, the government's not going to know what to do. They're going to ask for a status hearing on this. Hopefully the judge will help me get an attorney because I can't afford a million dollar attorney in my own. Uh, and then we will start weeding through the lies and they'll conduct a, a hearing or an investigation or do something. Uh, I'm fully prepared to surrender myself to custody. 
Um, I'm fully prepared to tell, you know, the absolute truth. I just, you know, Adrian, it's something I have to do. I'm 56 years old. I'm not in the greatest of health. Um, but I don't want my legacy to be that I was a piece of shit lion con man. I want my legacy to be that he was what he was, but he did the right thing. I'm not trying to say I'm Sir Galahad or anything like that, but in my eyes, right is right, wrong is wrong. And when I close my eyes for the final time, I want to know that I've got a clear conscience that I did everything I could to tell the truth. Yeah. Could this lead to you getting into some trouble, like being arrested? Oh, absolutely. Or- I, I absolutely anticipate I have a proffer agreement that has to be reconstructed. I had one from 2001. I know that they'll probably come at me with everything in the kitchen sink now um, to try to defend the mistakes they made. But I look at it this way. It's not 2001 or 2005 anymore. It's 2022. People know that the system is corrupt. Jurors know the system is corrupt. Um, Don't think for a minute that Chuck Maselli is saying I condone what certain police officers have done to minorities or anybody. Um, Case in point, the guy that was, you know, choked to death in, I think it was Minnesota. Um, Once a man's in handcuffs, it's over. Case in point, um, the guy that was shot 17 times in Wisconsin. Um, any cop that carries a gun professionally and a guy's got a knife and says, I'm going to my car to get a gun and you got to shoot him more than one to the head and one to the chest, you don't belong carrying a gun professionally. You know, anybody that's got to beat an inmate or a detainee in handcuffs so he can feel like a man doesn't belong wearing a badge, period. Yeah, that's not right. Anybody that, anybody that wants to pick on somebody because of their sexual persuasion, race, creed, color, whatever, um, judge a man by his actions and deeds and how he treats you. I'm good with that. I'm out there on the job. You swing on me. You're going to try to take my head off. You're going to pull a gun on me. I would have ventilated your ass. But if someone's minding their own business or doing whatever, and you just think I'm going to jump out of a squad car and because I got a badge and a uniform on, I'm, you know, I'm Christ almighty and I'm judge, jury and executioner. Those people don't belong in law enforcement. I'm, I'm all for that. Same regard though. You know what? All these people that are screaming defund the police and this and that, what are you going to do when the police aren't there? Because those are the first people that when they get robbed or their car Get stolen or carjacked or oh, call nine one one. Oh, they want them there in a minute. <laughs> yeah, can't have it both ways. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man, uh, and telling your story. You know, and uh, it's it's been good, man. You you, you really got a story, and you know, uh, and I'm sorry there. it took so long. And I'd like to do, you know, if you want to do a follow up after the tenth, uh, hopefully yeah. we can do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. I appreciate it. Well, what'd you think about everything he had to say? Please leave a comment, hit the subscribe button, and hit the playlist button at the end of this video because I got a lot of other mob interviews that I've done. So thank you. I appreciate you watching.